uh, <clears throat> verse 17 has been uh, an irritation to a lot of people. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.17 has been an irritation to a lot of people down through the years. Uh, it, has, uh, it has been a basis to me for not baptizing people. It's been a, a fact. Paul said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel always said to me that Paul couldn't possibly have been under the Great Commission of Mark 16 and have made that statement. For obviously, the gospel of, first, of, of Mark chapter 16, the person was sent to baptize. For instance, he said, go and teach all nations, or go and uh, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. No way could Paul say, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. But immediately then the question arises, why did he baptize people? And if you, uh, like for instance, if you were to meet a, a Ruckmanite and you refer to the passage, immediately he brings up the issue, well, Paul baptized people. Well, that would imply then that Paul is lying in the matter. So Ruckman, to get around it, play both ends against the middle, inserted the word in there. He said the passage really means, for Christ sent me not primarily to baptize, but to preach the gospel. But that won't work, see, because uh, Paul would have been able to say primarily. I mean, God knows the word. And so there's something that's terribly wrong with it all. So, now, if Christ was sent, in other words, if Christ was sent by God, and then Christ sent the apostles, and on and on, there are specifics in which they were sent for. Jesus Christ said, I am not sent, but under the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But in Acts, uh, in Matthew chapter 15, he healed a Syrophoenician woman's daughter. In Luke chapter 7 or 8, there is a centurion, a Gentile, who had a servant that was sick. He sent to Jesus to come heal his servant, and Jesus went and did it. So what I need to say then, when Christ said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But what he really means is, I am sent primarily to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But that won't work, you see. So uh, Jesus Christ said, He that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me. He that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. So I know there's a chain of command, so to speak. For me to get to the Lord Jesus Christ, I go through the gospel of Paul. For me to get to God, I go through Christ. In other words, I go through Paul to Christ, through Christ to God. And that's the way it is in the Bible. No need to fool around with primarily. But now that brings me back to the passage again. Why would Paul say Christ sent me not to baptize if he did it? Is he being disobedient, or does it just not matter? So some people say, well, it didn't make that big a difference. In other words, Christ didn't really send him to baptize, and therefore those he baptized, it didn't make any difference about. But it would make a difference right now. For instance, if we had a baptistry up here, and uh, we're baptizing people, then those that are baptized are set apart from others. That's what baptism was for. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Bible refers to Israel going out of Egypt were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. In other words, baptism, they were identified and they were separated away from Egypt. They were separated unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Water baptism separated people from one thing unto another and on and on and on it goes. Now, I may not have the answer you can determine as to whether I do or not after we've finished here tonight. Read with me from verse 10. 
Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now the word speak there is like identification that you all identify the same thing. I, I could say that, although that's not exactly what it's saying, but it would imply that. Like, for instance, if I were to say to somebody, uh, are you saved? And he says, I'm a Baptist. I say, uh, how about you? Are you saved? He says, I'm a Methodist. Well, they're identifying themselves by the words they speak. Okay. Paul said then, I'm writing unto you that you all speak the same thing. In other words, if they all say the same thing, in other words, if somebody says to them, say, well, how about you? Are you saved? And they say, well, yes, I'm saved by the grace of God. Jesus Christ died for my sins, was buried and rose again. In other words, they're all speaking the same thing. But if there's one popped up and said, well, yes, uh, I repented of my sins and was baptized for remission of sins, and I'm keeping the commandments, holding out to the end, and all, then they're not speaking the same things. And there's a division in there. Now, there's no possible way that a portion of the people in that could have said, I'm baptized with the baptism of repentance, while the others say, I was not baptized, and them all speak the same things. Now, so we must all speak the same thing. We must all identify under the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Now, verse 11. For it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, <clears throat> and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? And the answer to that is no. Was Paul crucified for you? No, he wasn't. Although he suffered for them, he wasn't crucified for them. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And the answer is no. <clears throat> I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now, there are those today that would have you believe that Paul baptized some at Acts 19. So I want you to hold on there and go to Acts 19. Acts 19. In Acts 19, <clears throat> verse 1, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Under what then were you baptized? And they said, Under John's baptism. Now before I go too further, too far, when he said, when the Bible said finding certain disciples, the, the things that are said make it appear as if they had been baptized and that's the way he knew they were disciples. For some reason, he knew about their baptism. Most likely, they had confessed some form of baptism as a means of salvation. <clears throat> so he called them disciples. Verse 3, he said unto them, Under what then were you baptized? They said unto him, they said unto John's baptism, then Paul said, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about twelve. Now, verse 5 is a controversial passage. You will observe that the word this in verse 5 is in italics. 
Therefore, the word this is not in the original text. The word this is not in the Greek text. So if I were to leave it out, and I'm not even implying that we should, but in verse 5, when they heard they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, you see, I could say and present an argument in court to this effect. When they heard they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, not after they heard they were baptized, when they heard they had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, then so and so. You all understand? Look at it again. Verse five, verse 4. Then said Paul, John barely baptized the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people they should believe on him that which should come after them, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and in other words, they found out something would be the implication without the word this. You understand? In other words, there would be no rebaptizing in the context. When they heard they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them. Now that's not why I'm not saying that's the way the passage is. I'm saying that's the way that some, or in fact, Mr. Cornelius Stam, that's what he says about the passage. He tries to get around Paul having baptized them again. But I don't need to go to that extent to get around Paul having baptized them because Paul didn't baptize them. How do I know? You'll have Acts 19, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians 16, uh, verse uh, 5, Now I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia. I do pass through Macedonia. It may be that I will bide yea and winter with you, that you may bring me on my journey with us wherever I go. For I will not see you now, by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you, if the Lord permit. But I will tarry at Ephesus, until Pentecost. Well, then I know that 1 Corinthians is written while Paul is at Ephesus. It would have been written during the time of Acts chapter 19, verse 24, 22. Go back to 1 Corinthians, I mean to Acts rather. Go to Acts chapter 19, verse 21. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the Spirit when he had passed the Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I've been there, I must see Rome. Verse 22, So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus. He himself stayed in Asia for a season. Go back to Corinthians, and this time go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. For this cause have I said unto you, Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, and on and on and on. There is no doubt about it. Paul wrote the Corinthian letter at the time of Acts 19, verse 21, 22, and so forth. Now, he stayed in Asia for a season. I'm going to put on the board up here. Now, let's just say that right here uh, is the Mediterranean Sea, Galilee, Jordan River, and the Dead Sea. The Red Sea would be down here. And say Asia is like up there, come down with some kind of strait, or I forgot what it's called. And Corinth would be like down here, come on around over here, and finally Italy, Italy is back over there. Ephesus would be in here, Galatia over here, and so forth. Now, Paul is at Ephesus writing the Corinthians a letter. He's going to come to them. He later on did, 
went up here and came down to them over there. But he said in this letter here, I'm going to tarry at Ephesus for a while, but then I'm going to come unto you, and so forth. So he's writing from Ephesus. Anybody got a question? Now, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Now, this is so simple, even I can get this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 16, And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Now, that'll be, let's count them. Stephanus would be one. If I move up the line, Gaius and Crispus, there would be three people and Stephanus' household, right? Verse... Uh, 16, I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Now, do you believe that Paul went to Ephesus and baptized 12 men, wrote a letter thereafter, and didn't remember having baptized the 12? Wouldn't make any sense at all, would it? In other words, when Paul got to Ephesus... There's the twelve that are disciples. He said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? They said, we don't even know whether there be any Holy Ghost. He said, under what were you baptized? They said, the baptism of John. After He said, well, John baptized under repentance on and on and on. After they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord. If Paul baptized them, wouldn't it be ridiculous to write to the Corinthians and said, I don't remember that I baptized more than three and the household of one. If he had baptized those twelve when he got there, that's ridiculous. I mean, if that man can't remember longer than that, baptizing twelve people, it would sure put a quietus to the, to the, uh, you know, the, the baptism thing. I mean, if it meant no more than that, I mean, I baptized 12 when I got here, but I don't even remember doing it. It'd be kind of crazy, wouldn't it? No, it won't work, folks. He didn't baptize those 12. And uh, the implication is they're the reason for him being associated where their concern is that he did what he always does. He went to the synagogue. They would have been at the synagogue. If they're disciples, that's where they would have been meeting and therefore, in view of Israel's hang-up on baptism, Paul would have discussed baptism with them, and then he would have laid hands on them after they were baptized. But he had no part in the baptism. I'm confident of that. Now, back in uh, 1 Corinthians 1 again. Anybody got a question? All right, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 again now. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 13. Is Paul, I mean, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you. But Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I'd baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. The implication would be that that would be Acts 16. Stephanus would probably be the, excuse me, be the jailer of Acts 16. Verse 15, uh, baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptize any other. Bless your soul, there goes Lydia and her household. I mean, he, he didn't baptize them, and on and on. Now, verse 17, why? For Christ sent me not to baptize. The word not is an extreme negative word. Uh, I don't know anything about Greek, but I do know that the word is O-U, like that. That word is the most, in other words, it expresses full negation. It, uh, there is no shadow of turning in there. There's, in other words, Christ sent me absolutely not to baptize is what he's saying. That's what the word means. Uh, all right, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So we're still hanging here then with, well, Paul, why would you baptize? 
Now let's check some things out. Let's check the sending of Paul. Turn in your Bible, please, to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9 in one hand, Acts 26 in the other. Folks, I've got the answer. Now, you may not agree with the answer, but I've got it. Acts 9 and Acts 26. All right, in Acts chapter 9, uh, Paul got saved. Uh, verse, uh, go to verse uh, 20. He's, he's in Damascus now. After he's saved, he's in Damascus. Verse 23, after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying in, laying await was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night, led him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Hold on to the passage and turn to Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. All right, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Verse 17, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter. Now, so if uh, I put on the board up here and I say, Okay, Paul gets his orders in Jerusalem here. Damascus is up here. So Paul takes off up here. On the way up, he, the, the Lord appears unto him. He sees the Lord, and the Lord saves him. After he's saved, he goes up to Damascus. God sends Ananias unto him. Acts chapter 9. Ananias goes in and says, you know, whatever to him, and says, uh, the Lord sent me unto you, on and on and on. So Paul, he's blind as a bat at that time. Then his, his sight is returned to him. After his sight is returned to him, uh, he leaves there. In other words, he, he preaches around there and then leaves or else like this. He leaves, however you fix it, he comes down to Arabia. Now he spent three years in Arabia. There are several people, in, for instance, the uh, twelve apostles spent three years in the ministry of the Lord. He spent three years teaching the twelve. Why would he not spend three years in teaching the apostle Paul? Paul comes down. What's in Arabia? Mount Sinai is. And so Paul comes down there, and he spends time. Probably the Lord is teaching him. Then Paul goes, up ba goes back up here. And after he gets up here, he's preaching Christ to these people, and they get hot and anger with him, and so the, the disciples let him over the wall in a basket because they've got the militia out there watching for him, and so he sneaks out by night, and he comes back down, and then he comes to Jerusalem. When he gets to Jerusalem, they won't have anything to do with him. They're afraid of him. But his brother-in-law, uh, Barnabas, brings him to them and introduces him later on, but nevertheless, all I'm after in the context is his trips to Jerusalem. He came to Jerusalem, Acts chapter 9, verse 26, when Saul was come to Jerusalem, on and on and on. Now, uh, notice in verse, uh, verse 28, he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem, and he spake bold in the name of the Lord Jesus, disputed against the Grecians. Uh, they went about to slay him, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus, all right? Now go to chapter uh, uh, let's see 
go to chapter 11. Chapter 11. Verse 25. Chapter 11, verse 25. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. Now, by the way, Barnabas is his brother-in-law, and I don't have time to deal with that tonight, but he would have known where he was and on and on, so he goes after him. Verse 26, when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. Verse 27, though, these days came prophets from Jerusalem and Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, signified by the Spirit there should be great death throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwell in Jerusalem, uh, in the Judea rather, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. All right, so uh, he, he ends up at Tarsus. Uh, they get him, and he goes to Antioch, which would be up here somewhere. And... Uh, they made up an offering for these saints down here, so he comes back to Jerusalem. So that's two times now that he's been to Jerusalem. All right, go to chapter 12 and look in verse 24. Chapter 12, verse 24. But the word of God grew and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Now there were in the church there was Antioch, certain prophets and teachers, and he names them and whatever. Verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. All right, so they go. They leave. Now, uh, go over with me to uh, chapter 15. Chapter 15. Now, at this point, Paul has made two trips to Jerusalem. He went to Jerusalem to begin with. The brethren didn't receive him. Uh, he got to know some of them at that time through the introduction by Barnabas. And then he went up to Tarsus and finally went up to Antioch and they met up an offer and sent it down to Jerusalem. So he comes down there. He goes back up to Antioch and now he goes on this on a ministry uh, which he ends up out here in the in the uh, Mediterranean Sea uh, in Acts chapter 13 and whatever, makes the tour, and then he goes up through Galatia, and later on an argument comes about the people that have been saved. The Judaizers get to them and say, there are certain things you have to do if you expect to be saved. Now, chapter 15, verse 1. Certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised, after the man of Moses you cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. Being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenix, Samaria, uh, Samaria declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. Verse 4, When they were come to Jerusalem, they're received of the church. All right, so Paul comes back to Jerusalem for the council meeting, Acts 15. So that's a third trip. Now, Acts 16, he, uh, he makes a tour up through Galatia and whatever and preaches. And, and uh, on his, while he's, when he goes up through that now on this journey, uh, he's going in this direction. And the Lord spoke to him and said, in effect, you're not to go in that direction. I've got another man going to go over there. Peter's ministry is going to end up over there. So the Lord turned him around, and he heard a man from Macedonia. Macedonia's over here calling, and they came over here uh, to um, Philippi. And so they continued their ministry over here, and they came down the seacoast, uh, ministering, and finally end up in town. Turn to Acts chapter 18. Acts 18. After these things, Paul departed from Athens, came to Corinth, found a certain Jew named Aquila, 
and on and on. Verse 3, because he was the same craft, he abode with them, that is, with Priscilla and Aquila. Verse 4, he reasoned in the synagogue, and on and on it goes. All right, so he's, he's down here in Corinth now. He's preaching in Corinth, preaching uh, to begin with in the synagogue. They blasphemed, and when they did, he left there, went into a man's house that joined hard under the synagogue, the Bible said, and he established the Corinthian church at that point. Now watch. Acts chapter 18, verse 18. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, then took his leave of the brethren, sailed thence into Syria, with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sincrea, for he had a vow, came to Ephesus and left them there, he himself entered the synagogue. All right, Paul then leaves Corinth. He came to come across, and he came to Ephesus. And while he's at Ephesus, he goes into the synagogue and preaches unto them. Verse uh, 20. When they desired him to tarry a longer time with them, he considered not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. But I will return again unto you, if God will, and he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up, all right, so he leaves, a, he, caught, he caught a ship down here somewhere, we don't know exactly where, and he sailed. He came over here to Caesarea, landed, and went up to Jerusalem. Now watch that. Uh, I don't know how well you know the English language, but there ain't any other way that this can be. Notice in verse 21 again. Bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. Verse 22. When he'd landed at Caesarea and gone up. Gone up where? Gone up to Jerusalem. Where was he going? He was going to Jerusalem. He went up to Jerusalem and saluted the church. He saluted the Jerusalem church. Right? So we know then, and by the way, you can check all the writers and the commentators and any other taters you can find, and it's going to end up that the word gone up is not associated with Caesarea. It's associated with a context. What is it? Keeping a feast at Jerusalem. That's his purpose in going there. And verse 22, when he'd landed at Caesarea and gone up, gone up to Jerusalem, then he left there and went to Antioch and on and on and on. So I know. But it's higher. Now, those Caesarea is on the sea coast, and uh, uh, over and over and over, you'll notice the term went up to Jerusalem. All right. Now, over and over, you find this kind of thing. So we know then, Paul. This is the third trip that Paul makes to Jerusalem. Okay. Now, he makes one more. When he makes the next trip, he's arrested. Now, turn to Acts 22. Acts 22. Now, like I said, this may not solve the problem for you, but it does for me. I have no doubt about it. Acts 22 and notice in verse 17. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. Now there's no indication that Paul would have prayed in the temple. Uh, when he first went there, they wouldn't receive, hey, they didn't want him there when he first went there. There's no indication that he would have been praying in the temple when he went there at the conference at Jerusalem. 
But when he went back, he went for a feast. He went for a feast day. He must keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. There's every indication that he would have been in the temple. Now, so I'm saying that Acts chapter 22, verse 17, came to pass, I was come again to Jerusalem, would be the time of Acts 18. Now, Verse 17, it came to pass when I come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance and saw him saying unto me, Make haste, get thee quickly out of Jerusalem. They'll not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I am imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and knew the, and, and kept the raiment of them that slew him. Verse 21. And he, Jesus Christ, said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. And they gave him audience unto this word. Then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth on and on and on. Now, when the Lord appeared to him then, as far as I'm concerned, Acts 18, verse 22, the Lord said him, Uh, further or some such thing than from that which he had sent him at the beginning. Now take Acts 22. You'll have Acts 18, Acts 22, now Acts 26. I'm sorry. Uh, Acts 26 now. This is Paul's testimony now from Acts 9. Acts 26, verse 15, I said, Who art thou, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. Already appeared to him more than one time. Verse 17, Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith, that is, in me. Now, that would be Acts chapter 9. I'm saying the Lord would have sent him further in that appearance of Acts 18. In fact, whether I'm right about Acts 18 or when it is, there ain't no doubt about it, folks. When the Lord first sent the Apostle Paul, Acts 9 and Acts 26, he didn't send him far hence unto the Gentiles in the sense that he uses the word over there. The Lord appeared to him later and said, Get out of here. They're not going to receive your testimony concerning me. I'll send you far hence unto the Gentiles. And when Paul told those people that the Lord had said that, that made them hopping mad. They tore their clothes off, threw them into the air, threw dust in the air, and said, We need to kill this man. Why? Because that man had said the Lord sent him to some people that had been cursing Israel. Paul had been going to those who blessed Israel up to that point. Now he's to go to those who cursed Israel and they said, we won't tolerate that. It's not right that he should live. He must die. So when Paul wrote to the Corinthians after Acts 18, Paul goes from Jerusalem. He makes another he leaves Jerusalem, he goes up to Ephesus, and he wrote the Corinthian letter, Acts 19, after having seen the Lord in the temple at Jerusalem, the Lord said, I'll send you far hence unto the Gentiles. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, Christ said, I, I'm glad that I didn't baptize any more of you than I did. And then he said, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. In other words, Paul 
no doubt was at liberty to baptize some people in his beginning ministry of Acts 9 through 17 to 18 long in there. Then the Lord appeared unto him and said, No more. And so he didn't baptize anymore. He didn't baptize the twelve when he got there. Although people say he did. But he said, I don't remember having baptized any other than the three. Well, if he baptized twelve, he'd sure remember that. Well, why would he not have baptized them? Because Christ sent him, Acts 18, not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And that's what he did. Now, so he writes the letter from Acts 19. Now, uh, by the way, anybody got a question? Go to Acts 20. Uh, he later on leaves there. He comes back over here to Corinth. He leaves Corinth. And he comes back to Miletus. And uh, when he got to Miletus, Acts 20, verse 17, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I've been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mine, with many tears and temptations which befell me the laying way to the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, showed you and talked you quick uh, publicly from house to house. Verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, that was the way his minister was to begin with. Now, verse 22, Now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Save the Holy Ghost witness in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the minister which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. In other words, the gospel of the grace of God matches go far hence unto the Gentiles, so he preaches unto them the gospel of the grace of God. Now why is all this? Uh, there's a fascinating thing here. Let me quickly, if I can lay this out for you. By the way, in Acts 20, Paul wrote to the he wrote the Second Corinthian letter, and then the Roman letter in Acts 20, verse 3. Now, so in Paul's epistles. Let me put up here, and I'll say, okay, uh, there's the Thessalonian letter he wrote first, then the two Corinthian letters, then uh, the Galatian letter, and the Roman letter is six letters that Paul wrote before Acts 20. In other words, by Acts 20. In these letters... The Jew is referred to 25 times. Israel is referred to 14 times. Uh, Israelite referred to three times. And Abraham... is referred to uh, 19 times. All his ministry and those that are saved 
have a direct association with Israel because of Genesis 12. God said, Abraham, I'll bless you and your seed after you, and I'll bless the ones that bless you and curse the one that curse you. And so the people that Paul went to in all that time blessed the seed of Abraham. Therefore, they were associated with Abraham and Israel and the Jew. Now, after Paul was put in prison, he wrote Ephesians, uh, Philippians, Colossians, uh, Timothy, Titus, Philemon, seven letters. Now, this is not just coincidence. He refers to the Jew one time. He refers to Israel two times. Israelite, none. Abraham, None. You think that's a coincidence? I mean, Paul wrote 13 letters, folks. He wrote six of them up here from the beginning of his ministry until he went into that, went into Jerusalem in Acts 18. Then in Acts 20, he wrote Romans, 2 Corinthians, goes up to Jerusalem and writes the prison epistles after that. He referred to the Jew 25 times back there because these people are associated with Israel. They're connected with Israel. He referred to, and on and on. And then he goes into prison. After he goes into his prison ministry, which has to do with the gospel, the grace of God, it has to do with you Gentiles, he only refers to the Jew one time. Why? You have no association with the Jew. You know why? Israel is low am I where you're concerned. And on and on. That can't be an accident. But that isn't all. Previous to him saying, Christ appeared unto me and said, I'll send you for hence unto the Gentile. He's dealing with Israel and the Greeks. The word Gentile in much of the Bible is from this word right here. If, any, if you ever know anybody named Helen, <laughs> uh, the word is, is Greek for Gentile. In other words, it means Greek. Look in John uh, chapter, well, let's see, John, uh, in John chapter 12, verse 20. John 12, verse 20. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. Now, you must understand, and that word is the word I got on the board up here. Now, you must understand something. All Greeks are Gentiles, but all Gentiles are not Greeks. All Greeks are Gentiles. All Gentiles are not Greeks. That's not hard to get a hold of, is it? Hey, the Greek nation were Gentiles. Greeks. No need to do a little double shuffle here and whatever and say, well, what this really is is Greek-speaking Jews. Now, it ain't got nothing to do with Greek-speaking Jews. It's Greeks. Just like in the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, it had the head of gold representing Babylon, had the chest of silver representing Media Persia, had the belly of brass representing Greece. Alexander the Great, Greek. Greek culture, on and on and on. Well, the Grecians did something to Israel and for Israel that caused God to bless the Greeks on the basis of Genesis 12. 
Genesis 12, I'll bless you, Abraham. I'll bless your seed after you. I'll bless the ones that bless you and curse the ones that curse you. The Greeks were blessed. Now, turn please to Romans. Look in Romans chapter 2. Uh, in Romans chapter 2, look at verse 9. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also the Gentile. And bless your soul, that word is Helene. It's Greek. Look in verse 10. Glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, of the Jew first and also the Gentile. Once more, it's that same Greek word. Turn to chapter 3. In chapter 3, verse 1, what advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit did the Jew have advantage back there? Paul refers to him 25 times. Certainly had the advantage. Uh, look in verse 9. Verse 9. What then are we better than they, knowing no wise? We before proved both Jews and Gentile. Once again, it's the word for Greeks. They're all under sin. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And look in verse 32. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32. Give none offense, neither to the Jews nor the Gentiles. That word is Greeks. And it's over and over and over. No need for me to just keep on. No need to belabor the issue. Hey, folks. These people met in the synagogues. Paul would go in the synagogue. There would be Jews, Jewish proselytes, and Gentiles that feared God. And so, by the time that Paul, like in Acts 20, Paul has not got a different message, but the old message is to different people now. He's already instructed from here out you go far hence unto the Gentiles out there. In other words, you go to those people from now on that have been cursing the children of Israel. Why? Folks, Israel is down to their last leg, so to speak, by that time. And so when Paul told those people at Jerusalem that the Lord was sending him to such as you and I in this room, they said he deserves to die for this. And that's why he ended up in prison. Because he said that the gospel would be preached to people such as us in this room. They're still saying it. Paul was given the gospel to us in this room. What is that gospel? God would have all men to be saved and come under the knowledge of the truth. There's one mediator between God and men. His name is Jesus Christ, and he gave himself a ransom for all. Jesus Christ was a ransom for you. Jesus Christ died for your sins. Jesus Christ paid for your sins. Salvation's free to you. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to say anything, pray anything, confess anything. But you have to believe and receive someone. Believe that he died for your sins. Receive him as your Savior and it's done. Thank you for being here tonight.